having done my videos on uh, the Renaissance and the Baroque and giving you a little taster, I wanted to start uh, my individual videos, well not start because I did Piero della Francesca, but uh, continue with the father of the Renaissance and that is Giotto. He is incredible because he is so early, 1300s, very, very early 1300s we're talking about. And there are a lot of his works surviving, so we have a lot to choose from. But what I have chosen is this, this amazing, amazing fresco, uh, The Lamentation of Christ. And here it is. What's so amazing about Giotto is, in a way, his simplicity. A lot of the art at this time was uh, very gilded, very florid, uh, not really very um, interested in, in uh, what we might term as realism in figures being uh, realistic scale to each other, in perspective, in, in uh, simplified surroundings, and Giotto is what exemplifies this. And here we have a fresco from a fresco cycle at the Scrovegni Chapel in Padua. And it is uh, a very uh, well-known piece in uh, Renaissance and Baroque art of the lamentation over Christ. So Christ is dead and it's everybody's reactions to that. So here we have Christ lying on the ground. Again, quite an unusual way of explaining it. And here he is being held very tenderly by his mother, uh, who cannot believe that her son is dead. And then at his feet is Mary Magdalene, always very recognisable by her long red hair, often at his uh, feet, at Christ's feet, because uh, she, uh, her tears washed his feet and she dried them with her hair. And what we have to remember all the time is that people were illiterate in the main at this time. So this was a way of showing biblical stories. And so people had to be recognised. Mary is almost always in blue because she was the Queen of Heaven. And uh, Mary Magdalene, often in red, very often with long red hair and very often at the feet of Christ. But what else is going on here? We have the amazing emotion of the other Marys standing behind uh, the Virgin Mary. We have these incredible figures with their backs to us. Now this is real Giotto stuff and we don't know who they are and they're very weighted. And those figures with their backs to us create a circle around Christ. And then we have this very plain rock leading absolutely to Christ's head. So we have our eyes directed to the main uh, person in the scene, which because he is surrounded by these wailing and very um, demonstrably upset people, we might miss him. But no, Giotto's put that rock in and there's just this very symbolic tree, always symbolic in Catholic art. And it uh, has no leaves because it is, it is dying as Christ is. But look at the angels above, look at them. And this is when perspective, I'm not saying perspective hadn't been invented before, it just wasn't prioritized, but Giotto prioritizes it. And this is why he is called the father of the Renaissance. And here we have all these angels, all in different directions, different foreshortening, um, just, playing, in my view, above Christ's head. Obviously, they're not playing, but the perspective is. And against this blue, blue was coming in big time, and we'll talk more about that later. So Giotto, the father of the Renaissance, is how he is known. And he is Giotto di Bondone. Now, while we're on this subject, he is not Giotto, he is Giotto because the I is there to make the G soft. If the I wasn't there, he'd be Giotto. Now, just to give you an idea of how radical Giotto was, on the left, we have a mosaic of the Madonna uh, and child. And uh, this is in Ravenna, absolutely beautiful, full of gold, 
But if you look at it, and this is not, that there is never anything wrong with this at all. It's just a different way of showing what you want to show. But there is no feeling of any body underneath that uh, mosaic virgin at all. Uh, she's almost flat, as is her chair. So we do not have this idea of weight. If you think of those people with their backs to us uh, in, the, in the fresco we're studying, they have enormous weight to them. And this is the realism of the Renaissance. The Renaissance wanted more realism than what had gone before. And then in the middle, we have his uh, teacher, Chimabui. I mean, absolutely beautiful, but again, a lot of gold leaf. Um, if you look at the saints below the Madonna and Child, they're a very different scale. So at this time, scale was reserved for the most important. So if you were the most important person in the picture, then you would be the biggest. And then the angels, again, virtually no perspective going on at all, a little bit on the throne, but that's it. And then we have Giotto with his Madonna and Child. Now the scale is still a little off, but look at the perspective. You can see uh, the angels going back and back and back. They're not arrayed so we can see them all. They're in some kind of visual realism. And the Madonna, you can see her body. You can feel her sitting on that throne. And this is so early. This is 1310. And here is the father of the Renaissance kicking off the greatest art movement of all time. Now the fresco we're looking at comes from uh, the Scrovegni Chapel. It used to be known as the Arena Chapel because the palace it was uh, built next to was built on the site of a Roman arena. So this isn't a side chapel, this is a whole building uh, commissioned by Scrovegni, that's his name, and he got Giotto to paint the entire thing. So look at that. Uh, at least uh, three layers of fresco cycles surmounted by this incredible, incredible blue ceiling. So Sc Scrovegni was the son of a moneylender and he was pretty sure he wasn't going to get into heaven because moneylender was very much pr frowned upon. And so he commissioned uh, this chapel to essentially buy himself into heaven. So there we go, there's religious art for you. And here as part of the frescoes is Scroveni himself kneeling down, presenting the chapel to the Virgin Mary. So there's absolutely no, no hiding of what's going on here. And of course, frescoes were very, very difficult to do, but look at this chapel. So the upper tier, we have the life of the Virgin, just made a bit more difficult because it's a curved tier. The, the middle two main tiers are the life of Christ, scenes from the life of Christ, and below that are allegories of vices and virtues, uh, handily on a spectator's level, just to remind us of how uh, uh, great or not we are. And in between, there's all sorts of trompe l'oeil decoration. So here is, uh, if you see in the bottom left, this is where the lamentation is placed. Uh, below these um, other scenes of the life of Christ and above that, the life of the Virgin. And you can see the amazing decoration he's done between all the scenes. And just to say what I, why I chose this is the emotion on their faces, on the, on the mourners' faces, that this um, amazing figure has died and of course at the time they don't know that he is going to come back to life and I think for 1300s to see this uh, set of emotions being expressed is just absolutely wonderful and to give you an example of some of the other uh, fresco scenes in this cycle here we have the last supper and do you see again he's created this circle he is not scared of having a whole row uh, of people with their backs to the to the viewer because he wants to create this realism. He wants to create uh, a feeling of an enclosed happening. And this, this is just amazing. This is Judas betraying Christ with a kiss. And again, we've got all the heads there. They're not all ranged up so we can see them. They're in uh, a perspective realism. We've got these figures with their backs to us to create this circle around it. Judas in yellow, of course, 
uh, uh, surrounding Christ, enveloping Christ with his uh, yellow cloak. And then all these torches up above, giving the idea of depth. It's just superb. It's absolutely superb, this piece. And this is Giotto. This is Giotto in the 1300s. Um, it, just, it just takes your breath away. Now, Giorgio Vasari, who wrote The Lives of the Artists, without him, we would know very little about all these artists I'm going to be talking to you about in the Renaissance. He credited Giotto with the great art of painting as we know it today, introducing the technique of drawing accurately from life. And this is the thing, it's drawing accurately from life. Now all art, as we know, does, I mean, I paint abstract for goodness sake, does not need to be, but at this point in history, this was the most enormous um, move, development, don't let's say move forward, development. And it, he, that, this is why he's the father of the Renaissance. And just a little uh, thing to say at the end of this, look at the ceiling above the chapel. And this is beneath the most incredibly intense blue. And in fact, this is what the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel looked like before Michelangelo painted all over it. <laughs> and the reason this is so striking is it was painted with a new paint. And this paint was called Ultramarine. And all paint is, is pigment, so something ground down and mixed with a binder, whether it be egg or oil or water, to make it into a paint. So as I say, painting is just really mud uh, on walls. But this, uh, because uh, Venice was a great trading nation, they went all over uh, the East, uh, gathering up all sorts of things, and they found this incredible blue pigment from rocks in Afghanistan in a very particular area because in the in the past the blue they'd used as paint had faded very quickly but this is very very hard very difficult to grind down and so lasts really well and it's called ultramarine because it came from beyond the sea ultramarine and this pigment became more expensive than gold and that is the ceiling that is above the Scriveni Tapel. Giotto di Bondone, in an astonishing short time, revolutionised the art of Florence, of Tuscany, and in fact, of most of Italy. The first Italian master to achieve universal importance, Giotto is unquestionably one of the most powerful artists who ever lived. That is the Lamentation of the Dead Christ by Giotto. And he is the father of the Renaissance, and he is the beginning, and he is a master.